My name's Roland Mallinson. I'm on the council at Marks. So on behalf of Marks, I'd like to welcome you here. This is a joint event we run with IBIL. Uh, I won't introduce all the speakers. I'll leave that to Sir Robin. Uh, my annual plea, as some of you may have seen before, is simply that uh, I sit on the Amicus Curiae Committee at Marks. Uh, Marks is the European Trademark Owners Organization. So on behalf of trademark owners, we occasionally identify cases uh, that we think have importance to trademark owners and uh, we will submit amicus briefs on behalf of one party or the other. Uh, but half the game is actually identifying these cases as early as possible. Um, if we get in too late, often we can't do what we want to do. So my plea is, if you have cases that are in, look to be interesting, that might go on referral to the ECJ in particular, uh, but we also do general court cases, and we've done one to the WTO actually on the uh, Ukraine versus Australia plain packaging, uh, we'd very much welcome hearing from you at an early stage uh, and uh, we can see whether or not uh, we have a consensus in our committee that would then support your, your, your party if you're acting for a particular party or you have an interest. So please do contact uh, Marks. Our details for the Amicus team is, is on the website uh, and we'd welcome hearing from you. But tonight I will hand over to our chair, Sir Rodden Jacob, who will introduce the panel uh, and we should have a fun evening of, of questions and answers. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is, I think, the fourth time we've done this. The fact you keep coming back shows it works. As usual, we have a panel of extremely distinguished speakers. Marianne Grubacher has come all the way from Germany just for this. And she's very kindly, um, therefore, going to find herself particularly exposed to the possible attacks that sometimes the English think of the German system just as an English person might in Germany find it the other way around. Oliver Morris did it last year and he agreed to come back. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Hobbs has something of an obsession about trademarks, so it's not surprising he's here. Nicholas Forward disclaims any knowledge whatever of trademarks, um, but has a huge knowledge of the workings of the general court. Some of the questions he can dodge, others he can't. And one other thing, I've had the sheer brazen effrontery to launch my book here. It's got some good bits in it and some bits that will bore you to tears. But anyway, I did it. If anyone wants me to sign it, I'll do it. <laughs> but you have to buy it first. Right. Right, question one. I, we always have a bunch of questions. Some are sent in, some are not. Uh, first one is a little general one. And I'm going to pose it first of all, I think, to Nicholas Forward. Has it surprised you how many references to the CJEU for preliminary rulings continue to arise in trademarks even 20 years after the CTM system started? Would you have expected them to tail off or get bigger or what? I, well, I must admit, I hadn't um, been aware of the trend until you, the, I saw the draft question and then I started to look. And uh, the figures just, uh, let's see if I've got them here. I think that if one looks at the figures over the last five, e five years, uh, let's say uh, 10, 2010, 11, 12, 13, and 14, uh, they went up from 35 in 2010, 47, 46, 43, 69. That looks a slight trend, uh, trend upwards, but uh, it is a trend upwards. If you go back a further five years, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, they were 5, 19, 22, 21, 31. Seen in that perspective, I think there is a significant growth. Of course, it was uh, during that period that the uh, direct cases were starting to come in uh, as the uh, uh, office in Alicante was producing its decisions and they were working their way through to appeals. I'm afraid it's just um, a uh, reflection of the simple fact that Answer, courts' answers to questions merely tend to give rise to even more questions. 
And uh, every time that a question come to, is back, then lawyers are remarkably good, in my experience, of either looking for a point of distinguishing the existing decision, say, does it make any difference X or Y, or quite frequently, and I think I'm afraid to say that the Luxembourg courts, not being specialist trademark courts, and that to a certain extent applies uh, even more to the Court of Justice than my own, uh, sometimes uh, on more technical aspects do uh, produce answers which trademark specialists find difficult to understand. And that, of course, results in cases coming back. And national judges, I think, see this because when they get their answers back, quite frequently they come back and say that hasn't quite answered the question that I put. So uh, I'm not surprised, and I suspect that that trend will continue. Whether it uh, produces uh, some change in the way that these cases are dealt with, I don't know, but that I suspect is a longer term and a different question. Marianne, what do you think? Um, I join. <laughs> uh, and I think it's inherent in a human society to deepen questions, and at least it's the lawyers and the um, judges bred. Uh, to raise new questions, and it's a sort of hiking. Uh, you think there is a summit, and around the rock, you see, okay, the summit is uh, quite far. Um, I, I think we will deepen all these questions more and more. And, then, and as you said, um, I got the answer from the uh, Court of Just Justice, and I said, oh, they didn't. They didn't answer my question. So um, we have to do another re uh, reference. Uh, it, it will go on. The business or the show, whatever you call it. Oliver, what do you reckon? You have to sit there uh, uh, the, applying this stuff. Exactly. I mean, I agree with the, uh, the speaker so far. I mean, I'm actually famed back in the office for coming up with extremely bad analogies. Well, I've come up with one here. Uh, we'll see how well it, how well it goes. Um, I, I've taken it as an analogy to an onion, that once you peel the layer off, even, even the, the thickest of layers, you've still got another layer underneath, and whether or not we're ever going to get to the core of that onion, or the particular issue in question, is, uh, is, is, is probably not going to happen. Um, and I think, you know, to pick up on some of the other points, you know, there, there is a tendency with, with some of the, um, the references that come back where the, the answer isn't as clear as, as we'd uh, hope it to be. I think the O'Neill case, for example, on genuine use is, is an example of that. So it's inevitable then that member states are going to have to ask the question, perhaps in a, a different way, to try and get the answer that they were hoping the first time round. Jolly good analogy, an onion. It makes you want to cry. Geoffrey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with that. Absolutely agree with that. Um, not surprised. What have we got? We've got poorly drafted legislation. We've got poorly defined legal concepts. We've got nebulous rulings which give rise to question-begging answers. Um, it's a recipe for more and more and never-ending references with more and more inconsequential answers. If I said to you at the beginning of all this, which was when, I suppose, 1994, that you were going to end up with a system of law which, in terms of infringement and relative rights, um, uh, postulated that you could have use of an identical or similar sign in the course of trade in relation to goods or services and it would be actionable if it was in a context or manner liable to adversely affect the functions for which the trademark is protected by registration. You would have said to me, that's bad law, it's bad law, it lacks legal certainty and no good can come of it. Now the rot started to set in, uh, it, it, looking back on it from this end of the telescope, the rot started to set in when um, Arsenal and Reid went to the Court of Justice, um, Advocate General Ruitha Abo Colomere very laudably said, in his opinion, to say use of a mark as a trademark is to say almost nothing. I have to flesh out that concept and tell you what it means. A few more, ca that was fine, a few more cases down the line and, and they're starting to talk in terms of protected functions. The functions aren't finite. They seem to be making them up as they go along. You've had, you had, remember, possibly 10 references on the question of repackaging of pharmaceuticals. If ever there was an opportunity for a court that was minded to say so, to say that interference with protected functions is a reason for reinvigorating the trademark right, they had that opportunity and they never took it. I reckon myself that it's round about the time of, um, uh, 
Opel, Opel and Altec, the modelling on the model cars where they started to get heavily into functions and by the time they got into L'Oreal and Velour, there was no stopping. And what's more, what bothers me more is that um, as you read around the subject, you find that the number of functions is astonishingly uh, lengthy. I found something in a book uh, uh, which was published by some Netherlands authors some time ago and they refer back to Professor Fetzer in Germany, and he identifies as many as 17 functions worthy of protection. So I'll only read you five of them. The coding function, the guarantee function, the origin function, the guarantee of origin, the identification function. At the back end, it's got the trust function, the sales function, the advertising function. In between, there's all sorts of mysterious functions, and I don't think this is doing anybody any good. Bad law. Mm. Um, but I don't want to be controversial. <laughs> but does anybody in the audience think it's all fine? Hands up. And how many people think it's actually gone seriously wrong? Too many agnostics. Too many agnostics. You, 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 want to, you want something, John? Yeah. yeah. I don't agree with that. I think the legislation is fundamentally bad. It never addressed all the known problems in trademark law which have been discovered in the trademark laws of the countries of the European Union. So, did the thing do anything about comparative advertising? No, it didn't. If you say same mark, same goods equals infringement, full stop, you end up with some daft answers and you've got to find a way around. And half of this is trying to find the way around the bad legislation. And the, 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 the little car case is a perfectly good example. Same mark, same goods, but no infringement. Because you have to come to that sensible answer. Yeah? Um, it's a bit of a plug for Marx, because if you were at the Marx conference in Vienna that we just held, the very opening speech was from a neuropsychologist who pointed out uh, how people, ordinary people, perceive what they see during the day, how they perceive what is on the shelves in a, in, uh, um, in a supermarket or wherever, and that it is things like the colours and the get-up, which is much more important to them. And he, therefore, uh, felt that it was the courts that were simply getting it wrong, because their perception of what consumers believe not the same of what the consumers themselves perceive. Yes, well I know we've always had those characters around. <laughs> they come and give expert evidence as to why you should find for the plaintiff. Claimant. <laughs> plaintiff. Claimant. <laughs> Trademark owner, let's sell <laughs> Right. Question two about interim injunctions. In some EU member states, you can get interim injunctions without any need for urgency. You can come along two or three years later. Does this need harmonization? In this country, you by and large can't, although I have an extra comment about that. What do you think? Marianne, about getting an interim injunction when the plaintiff has waited two years? Uh, we have even in Germany, you know, there are uh, the lender, the different lender, and uh, even in Germany, there are different times. Uh, so one court, let's say in Hamburg, um, demands, uh, or three months is enough, and in Munich they uh, demands for uh, four weeks. So it's splitting even in Germany, and I think uh, it should be harmonized. There must be a harmonization on this point within the European country because we see even in Germany it's it's hard it's not sat satisfying yeah and a couple of years ago the uh, circle of European trademark judges um, had a, in its conclusions exactly this point because in some other countries of the European Union they have the harmonized uh, at least in the country the harmonized system. And this is progress in comparison to the German um, habits. And I think we need it definitely in the European Union. Uh, I've got a slightly different take on this. Um, I think it's just a question of whether the delay should be a 
a bar to access to uh, interim injunctions. I think it's also a question of what sort of interim review or interim uh, relief uh, you're thinking of and what the task of the judge should be. Um, uh, in, uh, in my court, uh, I say what used to be my court, um, we are quite tight in relation to uh, applications for um, interim relief. In practice there, we're talking about sustainably effective commission decisions, so it's not quite the same uh, uh, situation. And of necessity, because of the timing rules, any application has to be made together with the substantive application that's within two months, so the point about timing doesn't arise. I think there's a different question that needs to be addressed in this context, and it's how far the interim measures judge should go into the relative merits of the case. Now, here I know, since American Cyanamid, the English courts have not really looked at it, apart from what, obviously. Um, obviously, I found the case that it was a kind of, even, what's it, it's reasonably arguable or something, I can't remember the precise wording of the test, but it, there is not much examination of substance. In some uh, other member uh, states, notably in, in, in Holland, there is a so called court within uh, procedure in which there is a, a fairly good, fairly thorough first look at the merits of a case before deciding whether to give one substance is, uh, in formal terms, as an interim relief, but in reality, quite frequently decides the case because uh, the, whoever wins uh, uh, the other side tend by and large to throw their hand in. And I wonder whether the question that should be addressed is not just a timing issue, but rather the question is whether there is a, a case for a fuller examination of the merits, um, not final, you can always get a possible review. And uh, that is something that in my own court we now started to do very recently within the last year in relation to suspending commission decisions. Instead of many saying it's a, 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 a thumus or whatever term you use, we've actually looked in the substance of the arguments that are raised and said these seem to have uh, reasonably strong grounds and therefore we will grant relief and that has in practice uh, and quite frequently produced a situation in which the person who loses uh, either withdraws the decision in question if it goes against the defendant institution or conversely uh, the plaintiff goes away and just drops the case because that's what they want. They don't want the defendant institution, they just want that first reaction. And I think that's something that ought to be uh, more uh, addressed if I was going to harmonize anything. It would be the available of a better procedure which allows this sort of first uh, review, not a definitive one, but at least a more substantial review than you get. I'll just add my own comment on that. I never paid the slightest attention to American cyanamid in trademark cases. And there's a good reason. Because Cyanamid was a patent case where the validity of the patent or the infringement of the patent was hotly disputed. And the economic effects of the infringement, if it was an infringement, were nothing to do with the legal question. In trademarks, that ain't so. In trademarks, generally the question is, is it too close? Well, if you're considering how much damage the plaintiff is going to suffer, that depends on the very question which the court will ultimately have to decide. So the interlocutory question and the final question are related. Et voila. Uh, um, but the, still the time question is another thing which I, they might just, I put in a judgment somewhere. If somebody's standing on your foot, you howl. If they say they've been, somebody says you've been standing on my foot for two years, then it's not hurting. So you don't get an injunction. Jeffrey. <laughs> yes, not all of the Chancery judges have followed Robin's example in that reasoning over years gone by. I've relied on it quite a few times, but it doesn't always produce the desired effect on others. Um, so far as um, the differences in national practices on injunctions, I think it's a very serious problem. If you manage commercially to knock a hole in a large chunk of the internal market by means of an injunction in whichever country it is, and then you combine that with the uncertain implications of what the actual reach of an injunction is when it's territorially limited, let's say, to Germany, but it stops um, web presence which might overreach borders into Germany. The actual footprint can extend well beyond the territory of the state concern. I actually think there is a serious uh, issue 
associated with the disparity of approach between different member states on this. I myself think it's only a matter of time before there is uh, a reference to the CJEU on it. As far as I can see, it's perfectly possible to raise one under the Enforcement Directive. Article 9 of the Enforcement Directive talks about um, interim remedies of this kind. And Article 3, which is the general principles provision, applies to that as much as to every other article in that directive. There's already been one reference to the CJEU on uh, the scope of remedies under the Enforcement Directive, and this is a, a prime candidate, in my view, for another reference. Um, the case law, um, it, it, it's, it's not very well publicised. You can find it when you look for it. Um, the decisions of the General Court relating to suspensory or interim measures, uh, my reading of them is that they generally require quite a pressing need with quite a good degree of justification before the Court will intervene. Now, if the uh, CJEU was to take the view that that should be a basic standard across the European Union, I wouldn't shed any tears over it. As far as I'm concerned, American cyanamide was the earliest and really least useful case management decision that was ever made. It was simply a way of managing cases rather than deciding cases. I thought it was retrogressive. Time yeah. to get rid of it. They turned up in the House of Lords with piles and piles of affidavits with an estimate of, I think, nine days. Diplock kicked them out on the first day with this. And in patent cases, at least, it was much better before. Of course, some cases are too difficult to make an assessment. Not trademark cases, generally, but a patent case can be high-tech and frightfully complex, and the court can't understand it. It takes days. But, but to apply it to all cases was a disaster. I asked Wolf to change it, but he didn't. Do you have any views on inter interim injunction? We I mean, don't really get many in the yeah, trademark well, registry. Yeah, we? <laughs> well, thankfully, we have none in the UK registry. Um, the, the, the only thing I could really add is, is, is obviously, I think Geoffrey's right that it, it does create a problem. I can, I can clearly see that. Um, but obviously, the, you know, the disbenefit of harmonisation is we, you know, we may end up with something that Geoffrey might cry about um, and end up with a, a more continental approach in, in terms of some of the, uh, the, the pitfalls that have been identified in your question. So, you know, whilst it is a problem, you know, it's... It's, you see, it's very strange. Uh, By and large, the Brits and the Germans are, are, are aligned on this in almost any subject. If you go for an interim injunction, you've known about it for, for a month, a couple of months. We don't have a precise time. Then you're not going to get it normally. That's the, 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 for the obvious reason, which I, which I gave earlier. Um, there are exceptions, of course. Years ago, I had a row with Hugh Laddie. We were both junior counsel for the British photographic industry, we're dealing with record pirates, no, big records. Anyway, we had, a, and we had people who went out and found the infringement and then we used to go to court and get an injunction. And of course, it turned into Anton Pillar. Anyway, <coughs> in one case, EMI came, and they went to Hugh first, and they said, look, it turns out that this was reported internally at EMI two years ago. Hugh said, you can't go. And somehow it came to me, and I said, well, I'm gonna go. Um, Hugh said, you can't have an injunction, an interim injunction after two years, wait. I said, well, there's an explanation. And they went to the wrong people, and we'll tell the court all about it. And it's a very strong case, because there was no defense. And he was always cross with me, because I went and got that injunction. <laughs> and that's a, a, an extra point, which does apply, may apply both in the unitary patent court. If the case is really strong, it's a genuine same mark, same goods case, counterfeit. Is it really a reason for withholding an injunction you didn't do anything about it for a year? So a bit of flexibility makes sense. Right. Did you want to ask me a question? No. <laughs> Not yet? Okay. <laughs> but this is a sort of odd one. Does anybody see any attraction in... in having jury trial for trademark infringement cases. The Americans do it all the time. 
just put 12 ordinary people in the box. Give them the facts. And say yes or no. Do you have any views on that? Uh, well, presumably you just need a majority verdict. Uh, about more than 50% yes. of the average consumers as represented yes. by the jury yeah. to be confused or to say they would find the Yes, maybe a majority verdict even. Uh, what do you think? I mean, it might cut yeah. out an awful lot of nonsense, wouldn't it? Well, I, I suppose it would be a substitute for what I do, which quite, quite frequently is to ask my wife. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you better, you better to get 12 wives. Boys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Secretaries or uh, employees uh, like the porters or whatever, are mm. we, are, we are asking. <laughs> exactly. Most of them ask my clock. She was much better than I was. But nevertheless, I've heard in Denmark they have a jury. Do they? A couple of years ago, um, in our circle, there uh, was a, a Danish uh, judge, and uh, he told us, I didn't prove it, and I don't know if it's anymore, uh, but they have uh, the average consumer, uh, but it, there might be a problem to choose them, because uh, you must know the, the uh, specific branch or sector, and um, what is aware, and was this the average consumer? So do you, do you look for somebody with a only basic education or middle education? Uh, I think this will be a system. Uh, the chairman would like it and they would produce huge uh, scales on it uh, who had, uh, has to be chosen and so. Uh, I think the system as it is is okay. Um, uh, the judges will uh, decide and um, of course, there are sometimes really nonsense uh, judgments uh, because no. you can read, everybody knows the um, sense of this Latin word or this Spanish word or whatever, and nobody knows, even in the English words. Um, we were asking our secretary uh, if she knows what flat rate is, and she said, flat rate. What is flat rate? <laughs> she doesn't even know how to spell flat rate. You see, <laughs> so, average consumer. What do you think, Oliver? I, I, I can't see any benefit whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's, a, there's a number of problems, I think, with, with, with that proposal. I mean, but firstly, you're just as likely to get a smattering of non-average consumers amongst uh, any group of 12 people. And you're probably going to spend more time trying to go through the jury selection process, trying to weed. No, no, you don't do that in England. We don't do. You're not. You can't. It's not an American jury selection. We've. Um, you just pick them, put them off the street. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Nick Nicholas asks his wife. Um, I, I now ask the children. Um, <laughs> if, if they're not listening, I go to the cat. Um, ho hopefully, I get a sensible answer there. But um, you know, it just it just seems to me to be flawed. And and I think. You know, in, in the past, perhaps judges could be criticised for being sort of slightly out of touch with the uh, with the normal everyday person. But I think uh, a lot of that criticism is, is now gone gone away. I think there's a, there's probably a lot of judges who are sort of more average than they used to be. Normal is the word that you want. <laughs> Jeffrey? No, average is the word. <laughs> so you talk to the cat, you might as well, I think, organise a sidebar a vote on the IP cat blog in order to get the IP cat. <laughs> um, this is a very sepia-tinted little proposal. Um, you used to sit with juries on the merchandise marks cases at the beginning of the last century, and the uh, trademark cases and passing off cases were tried in front of juries. That's fine. Um, I don't think in this day and age we, we would really regard that as satisfactory. Basically, the, the members of the jury have to get their law from the judge. The judge directs them on the law. By the time you spend enough time telling them uh, what the average consumer concept actually is, and it's not necessarily them personally, but it's a sort of legal construct, etc., 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 I'm not going to lift the lid on that Pandora's box any further. Um, I think you might just as well decide the case yourself. Uh, years ago, there were two chaps who were having a, a, it was a passing off action, they're both claiming to be, I think, the boxing champion of Barbados. And Mr. Justice Harmon said he would like to order trial by battle. 
Actually, the, the, <laughs> the jury, the, if you read, um, if you take the time ever to go back and look at Red Away and Bannon in the House of Lords in the late 1890s, um, it was a case tried before a jury in Manchester, and the question was what, did, what was the meaning and significance in the course of trade of the words camel hair belting. And everybody uh, up to day three of the trial thought that the words camel hair belting were purely uh, fanciful, invented, imaginary. And then somebody decided to go to Bellevue Zoo in Manchester and discovered to their amazement that the belting actually had some camel hair in it. <laughs> so from being on the wrong side of the dividing line between honesty and fraud, they were claiming to be using the expression camel hair belting in the public interest descriptively. The only effect of that was that whereas a judge might have had no problem with it, the jury came to a mixed verdict and it ended up in the House of Lords at the time. So maybe not a good idea after all. <laughs> well, there we go. So jury trial out for trademarks as well as patents. Right. What about a sort of enlarged jury? The ponies of a survey. Um, First question, has English law gone too far in restricting the use of surveys? Geoffrey. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, a number of thoughts spring to mind. First of all, it's not unique to this country to have a gatekeeper function, as I think it's now being called. There's two decisions of the US Supreme Court advising American judges to perform a, a gatekeeper function in relation to expert evidence including in relation to surveys. In Australia, in the federal court system, it hasn't been possible for over a decade to adduce survey evidence without permission, and the permission, as I understand it, is on application subject to scrutiny. Um, so, gatekeeper function is not a problem. If you're, in my book, if you're gonna have a gatekeeper function, it should be a meaningful one. And by that, I take it to mean that you're supposed to assess uh, what's being called at the moment the probative value of the exercise, which involves basically two things. It involves examining the methodology, treating it as an experiment, and analysing or looking at the uh, trend of the answers you receive on um, a pilot survey basis. Now, um, everybody who's had any experience in anywhere in the common law world with, with surveys knows that the process of dealing with them at trial is expensive. They also know that, as often as not, the results can be, and frequently are, inconclusive. My experience has always been that if it's a difficult case and you do a well-conducted survey, it tells you what you knew at the beginning. It's a difficult case. You get inconclusive answers. What do you end up with? You end up with um, the equivalent, if say you've got 1,200 results, questionnaires, you end up with the equivalent of 1,200 Civil Evidence Act notices over hearsay statements. You look at the answers and you end up looking at them as the tribunal and think, well, I can see those going that way and those going that way. What do I, what do, I do? How do I allocate them? It's not a statistical test or it's not supposed to be a statistical test. What do I do with all this stuff? At the end of the day, um, I, I think that the issue is, yes, we should have um, proper scrutiny of whether we let the evidence in or not. We should scrutinise it when it comes in. We should recognise that it's expensive. We should also recognise that although there are valid survey methods available, the main function of parties to litigation and trademark matters <coughs> is to try and get a survey organised that will produce the answers they want. And that distorting effect is what is primarily responsible for the judicial lashback that's been occurring in our system and elsewhere. Maria, what about surveys in Germany? I think your views are not entirely those of some others in Germany. No, I, I would <laughs> say it's definitely the contrary. Uh, uh, the survey is the first uh, uh, issue to uh, uh, prove uh, acquired distinctiveness by use. Um, uh, our, our Supreme Court um, is saying uh, it's the most reliable uh, uh, matter uh, to go in a survey. And we have the rule 50 plus 1% must be the result of uh, recognition of the sign uh, as a trademark. And um, But I think, um, and, and this rule is strictly in Germany, although the uh, Court of Justice says uh, it's only, uh, we can do it if there are no other methods uh, to be convinced of acquired distinctiveness by use. And in one trial, uh, my board, we, uh, we uh, tried 
to say the, the survey is only 46 percent. And but we don't um, focus now on this survey because we are convinced that this um, uh, uh, sign, it was the word test, it's the same like in English test yeah, for a consumer's magazine, uh, has acquired distinctiveness because of the numbers. It's used since the 50s. Uh, the market share is so and so. Uh, really overwhelming numbers. And um, the decision was overturned by our Supreme Court and it was said, no, if there is a survey and the survey is below 50%, you have to trust to the survey. The survey is reliable, and there won't be. Uh, you, ca you cannot assume uh, a quiet distinctiveness by use. So we really uh, have to trust on surveys. Um, sometimes, uh, in reality, in practice, um, we try to uh, give advice to the uh, claimants or to the parties, party, the applicant, in the cases of uh, application to say, please, give us numbers, don't go in service, give us numbers on your market share, your advertising, and so on. And so you can all this read in the uh, Kinsey case. Um, and uh, amazingly, uh, some of the applications were successful in this way. Um, so I think um, the contrary, as it is done in Germany, is, is too much. We should find a middle way between maybe the British way and the uh, German way. And um, one word uh, about the methodology, um, there is no strict method on service. I was asking our uh, institutes, there were four or five uh, reliable institutes in Germany, and every, uh, every institute um, is running a different method. So we have not a clear method. And that leads now to some decisions in the German Federal Patents Court where the judges are now saying, no, 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 this question, the question was asked since 10 years in every survey. No, this is uh, not correctly. Uh, it should be replaced by another question. So we are now, in the end, in a very confusing situation. So uh, I think it's quite good not to be too trustful in service, but to use it maybe more than you do it now in uh, here. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you something, Marianne. One of the <coughs> features of the English procedure, which you don't have in Germany, is if a survey goes in and is challenged, every single document about the survey has to be made available. So you get, the, you get the forms which were used by the interviewers. Uh, and uh, I've never seen a survey where they, filled up those, they all filled up the forms right. I once had a survey, which is in a reported case called Nice Pack, um, where every single form was no good. And it's a it was lot quite extraordinary. I mean, I was in the Court of Appeal, and I showed them some of them. Uh, and Fred Lawton said to me, Mr. Jacob, I see you've been picking towns and they were grouped by towns where they'd done them in, in, in the south of England. Maybe they're a bit more hard-headed and sensible up in the north of England. So I said, my lord, well, there you are. There's four northern towns. Pick your city and I'll show you, pick a form and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. That was, that was a good moment of advocacy there. <laughs> um, and then the people who process the results, categorize the results. They make mistakes, and it's quite frightening. And Jeffrey made a serious point that this is what I call, in a patent case, litigation chemistry. It's not a scientific experiment to try and find something out. It's trying to prove something, whether it's true or not. And that's what you conduct surveys for. Of course, Jeffrey has been quite quiet. He, he, he was on the receiving end of the survey in GIF and Neutrogena. Oh. <laughs> but you knew I'd say that. <laughs> well, enough of surveys. Um, let's have a slightly more technical question. You've got a nice Rolls Royce or BMW, and it gets into an accident, and the badge at the front, the flying lady or the BMW sign, goes on the bonnet. Somebody wants to make a replacement bonnet. Can they put the trademark back on or not? 
Oliver, you want to think about that one? Um, <laughs> I, uh, it's a very difficult and difficult question to answer for two reasons. One, I've, I've never come across it in, in, in any of my cases. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, and probably more importantly, I think a case has fairly recently come out from the Court of Justice on this, mm. um, but it's only in German. <laughs> um, no, 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 it's, uh, it's in a French. reference from, no, it's in from French, Italy. Sorry. It's um, from Italy, from Corte di Torino. I, I got one of my colleagues who, speak German, who speaks German and a bit of French to try and translate it for me, mm -hmm. um, and he, he gave me the answer, non. The, the, uh, the court says, no, that's not allowed. Um, but you know, we, we, without seeing the case in any more detail, it's difficult to give sort of specifics on that. I, um, I, my, I, sorry, I, I mixed some different judgments. I think that was okay, a, okay. A, yeah, a, Ford, a Ford case. That's, I think that, that, what that one So they just to. said, no, well, well, that's a bit difficult, isn't it? That means you get a monopoly in the spare part. Yeah, may I answer? Yeah. Um, the issue on the spare parts clause, the so-called spare parts clause, derived from the um, design law. And um, uh, the spare parts clause means that the, uh, it is allowed uh, to reproduce the, uh, the bonnet, the wing, the grill, uh, lightning, um, from not the original, we call it the aftermarket. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so this is not the case of litigation, uh, but, and this is the case now uh, deriving uh, from Italy, from the Corte di Torino, and is now uh, pending at the uh, Court of Justice, if on one of these spare parts the trademark is fixed on, and this definite case it was a Ford logo, uh, if this is the litigation of the trademark or if this is necessary to establish the original um, uh, feature of the spare part. So is, it, is the tra trademark just for decoration? Or, and now we are the 36 function uh, <laughs> uh, trademark, or is it still um, a sign of a commercial origin? Uh, if you fix it on the hub uh, uh, bonnet and so on. Um, and if it might be possible, if the uh, Court of Justice will say, okay, it's just decoration, so we have another problem with the functions of the trademarks. And I think it's destabilizing the, uh, the system of trademarks um, in this case. And it's uh, really a very important issue on the different point of views uh, of uh, original product producers. Uh, and the aftermarket, you know, and there are billions of euros or dollars or whatever behind this uh, question. And I think, um, personally, uh, we must find a solution, and still this is another point, um, uh, the European Union is divided uh, really in two parts. In some countries, um, the spare parts clause is in force, that means there is no litigation, and in other countries, like Germany, Sweden, France, Italy, no, not Italy, um, uh, it is litigation. If uh, another producer, not the original, produces a spare part which is not uh, the original one and brings it to the market. Uh, and we had now in Germany a case, uh, it was a BMW logo, uh, uh, for the Australian market, and though the German court decided this is litigation if you fix the BMW emblem, the logo, on a spare part uh, without any license or uh, um, a contract or whatever. So uh, it's really um, more or less uh, political. Um, we have to find a political uh, solution as well. So it's not only judges side, on the judges side. So Nicholas, if you pranked your Rolls Royce uh, uh, and the radiator grill was damaged, which itself is a registered trademark, um, you've got to go back to Rolls Royce or? You've got a bit of competition law about you, haven't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's leave the competition bit of aspects on one side for the moment. Um, I suppose, first of all, a question will arise as to whether you are actually using the trademark as a, a trademark if all you're doing is 
selling someone a Ford badge, you know the little oval badge that says Ford on it, or the, the flying lady, for example. Um, uh, but let's assume for the moment that uh, this, uh, the Ford badge is registered as a trademark for, for what? Spare parts? Is it really spare parts? For yeah, they'll be registered for spare parts. <laughs> spare part? Yeah, but is, is the trademark a spare part? I suppose it is a rather, a rather strange one. For motor vehicles and accessories and spare yeah, parts? Yeah, I, I have no doubt that the, the radiator is, but the, but the, the, the badge the, alone. The, 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 the badge alone. Is that really a spare part? I don't know. Right. No, right. It, it is not. Okay, okay, if the badge is not, then I suppose that gives rise to a different question. But, but there's also the question of then whether the badge uh, or the flying lady, for example, um, it is, uh, the value is uh, in the design, I don't know, it's, um, I don't know. As it seems to me, the, the real big question, you ran away from competition, this is the way, if you can make a spare piston rod for a Ford, because it hasn't got any trademarks on it, and lots of, lots of bits of the engine don't have any trademarks, mm -hmm. or, or, or the, 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 the exhaust pipe, no problem. But some bits of the car have the trademark built into them. So is it the position that you can compete in the spare parts market with the things without trademarks on, but the things that inherently got the trademark in, like the bonnet of a BMW. Or the radiator grill. Or the radiator grill of a, of a Rolls Royce. You can't. That's well, damn silly from the point of view of competition law. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Geoffrey? Yeah. The reference from Turin may not get to the uh, ultimate answer because I think it's framed solely in terms of design right. Yeah. I think. Um, a thought which occurred to me, and which I just share without any settled belief one way or the other about it, is um, that the Comparative Advertising Directive might possibly be used. It depends how far the court might want to stretch it. The definition of advertising is expressly or impliedly referring to the other man, his business, his goods or his services. The right to comparatively advertise extends to marks which are registered or unregistered, it's signs of any and all kinds. And if you were able to go down that checklist of requirements, I think the last time I counted it's seven in number, and you were essentially using the mark in question to show that your a replacement product was replacing like for like, and you were qualitatively not materially different from the branded product, I would think that there, there could be an argument that what you're doing is actually um, within the scope of the immunising effect of the Comparative Advertising Directive. Don't know. You, you want to say anything about this one, Oliver? Um, only to sort of pick up on, I mean, that, that, the, the, the decision that I saw, the rough translation, seemed to suggest that there was no derogation based on, on what you've just said, but no, I, I, no, I think we've called for a translation anyway to see um, you know, where it does end up. I mean, but I think you're right. I mean, it does, you know, it does create this problem that um, you know, a, a, manufa a third party manufacturer of spare parts, if they're being careful enough in terms of how they're marketing that product, i.e. not making out that it's an official Ford part, they're using their own trademarks to show that you know, th this is ours, and it's merely here as a, as a, a you know, to, to put the car back into its original appearance. You would hope that there would be some mechanism to, um, to sort of derogate the, the sort yeah. of normal rule of law. I mean, and that rational thing is to say, all right, well, you make it, but you must make it absolutely clear it's not a Ford part or a Rolls Royce part when it's being sold. But never mind. Um, this does raise a question which is not on the list, but. The IPCAP has raised it a number of times. The Court of Justice sometimes issues decisions in one language, and there's, there's a long time before there's translation into another, and in particular into the working language of Europe, English. <laughs> <laughs> and one Dutch judge said, me pity you joined the common market. I said, why? He said, well, we could have all agreed to use English if you hadn't been there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, who knows? Right. Now then, this is a technical one, but it's in part of the appalling drafting of this ridiculous trademark directive. The exclusion from registrability of shapes that add substantial value. How does that work in relation to designer goods? 
when the whole point of the shape is to add value. What do you make of that? Everyone's, have you, have, have, everyone's gone very quiet. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, that, that indent the shape exclusion is, I think, often the, the, the hardest one to sort of rationalise because I think we can all we can all understand what you know, the, the nature of something is, the function of something is. That's that's slightly more sort of easier to see, but the sort of substantial value one is is more difficult. Um, but you know, based on where the law is standing now, if the shape is sort of aesthetically pleasing, and that's really the only purpose for it, I think it is going to be difficult to get any... You know, I think that the question was design the product um, and, <coughs> and back to the registers. Being, um, the, being the speakers, they said, no, it's not distinctive. But but could they have used this provision? The thing about this provision, it's an absolute provision. Yeah, it's an absolute provision. You can't, you can't overcome it on evidence, no. Yes, well, I mean, I've had some of these cases. I had them in relation to so called Eames chairs. Um, and uh, I can't remember how far that went. And then there's the similar, there's a court of justice one in relation to the, the trip trap child's chair. Any of you who have children yes. will know that. Uh, um, I, there's a matter of that uh, practice I have been seeing over the last 15 odd years in the court increasing. Uh, use of uh, attempts to uh, use trademark law to extend the protection of designs. And I think uh, I don't believe that we necessarily dealt with that as effectively as we should. Personally, I believe it, it's a bad thing, uh, and one should, and indeed the court's case law recognises that that is there for the purpose of avoiding extending protection of designs beyond the, the, the strict time limits set out in the design legislation uh, to give an indefinite protection. Um, whether we've got it right or not, whether we've gone far enough, I'm, I'm not too sure that we have. Um, but uh, I see it more and more. It's coming back in relation to, uh, I had uh, also in relation to a case recently that I gave judgment about um, those stoves, I don't know, uh, wood-burning stoves, which have a particular shape. I think the case is called Bulayang or some, someone in Bulayang. Bula um, that was also about something else, but uh, for, for whatever, I, I think that was an incidental question in that case, because that was actually about whether there had been proper use of the, the, the design mark which had been given, uh, when it was also used together with a, a word mark on the front of the, uh, that, that was the issue we had to decide, but that case threw up what seemed to me at least at that stage as being a, a rather dubious question as to whether the the, the, shape, the, the shape of the stove alone uh, should have been uh, registered as a trademark. I mean, it seemed to have a sort of functional element or a, uh, appearance. Function and design. Fu Both. Function, function and design, yes. Right. Mm. Mm. But one of the difficulties yeah. as well is, yeah. um, is you know, how, how do you draw the line? Because a lot of the a lot of the shapes we're talking about become iconic over time. Yes. And, you know, at the outset, that might be downright ugly. And certainly if you were measuring it objectively at the outset, then you, you'd probably turn around and say, well, no, actually, that's not going to add any value to the, uh, to the goods. So I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a very difficult line to draw. All right. So first of all, I agree with you totally. And second, just to give an eye on the German jurisprudence, um, up to now, uh, we restricted this provision only to jewellery. And the, this we say, and jewellery, it's substantial value. Okay. And if we um, enhance it to uh, design and, and to, uh, what is it, designer goods, yeah? Um, up to now we say we said um, it's just a tool of marketing. Uh, it's not always substantial to these uh, uh, because fashion uh, is very fast uh, changing everything. And in two years it's it's not a substantial value anymore. It's for, forgotten. So we um, we uh, define it as um, a marketing tool. Could you register in Germany? The latest design of a BMW, and say, well, uh, they, you can, uh, no, they, they, no, as a not, trademark, not, they come along not and they say, they spend, we spend, I mean, somebody would say, but just a minute, BMW spend a huge amount designing their car to get customer appeal, to make it a, a better design than, 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 than Opal's or somebody else's. They may spend money as much as they want to spend, but it's still a design law and not trademark law. 
This is a really profound jurisprudence in Germany. Only design law. No trademark law on shapes uh, of a car or of uh, spare parts. This, I've read that trip trap case, that health judgment, about five times. It's a leading example, with due respect, of an impenetrable judgment. It's impossible to understand what they're expecting you to say and do when you decide these cases. I don't know what the legislative intent was behind that exclusion. I have a, a, a fear, a suspicion of a fear combined, that it was plugging into the American notion of aesthetic functionality, um, whereby beauty, beauty is, is something which can be relegated <coughs> to a functional role uh, and thus excluded from protection. Um, uh, if that's what they intended, then they've lifted the lid on a hornet's nest, because in the United States, I think at the end of each year, the review of the case law shows yet more um, fog and confusion surrounding the concept of aesthetic functionality. Um, whatever it does and whatever it means, however, I would like to suggest that the real unresolved question still to this day is how rigorous the word exclusively in the expression consists exclusively of X, Y, Z. If the word exclusively is interpreted rigorously, it would mean <coughs> that things which were merely whatever it was that the objection applied to would be caught by the exclusion, but things that were more than merely that would be free of the objection and you would assess them for registration on the grounds of distinctiveness inherent or required, which I think would be a satisfactory way of dealing with most of these cases, to be honest with you. Um, and in order to arrive, I believe, ultimately at a clear conception of what the word exclusively means in the expression consists exclusively, the Court of Justice is going to have to grapple with the thing that it keeps running away from, which is um, that something can simultaneously be functional and a trademark, that features of shape can simultaneously be both. And to borrow from uh, an example from some papers in a case which is pending on appeal to the CJEU, um, if you take a motif, choose one, a fir tree motif, just for an example, and it's embossed into the undersole of a pair of shoes, and it's in a repeated pattern, you could, if you wish to, say that that motif, as embossed, is a feature of shape, and that somehow or other one or more of these objections might apply to it. It gives you traction and so on when you're trying to run on loose surfaces and so on and so forth. And yet, if you were to recognise that something can simultaneously have a function and still be serving a trademark function, you'd have gone a long way to getting some coherence into these exclusions from registration. But we're not there yet. Well, I think it's another example of, 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 of poorly drafted legislation. I mean, this... If you sat down and written that, <coughs> said, well, how will this stand up in the courts? Just ask that question. You would have said, good Lord, they'll never know what to do. But there it is. The, those who drafted this legislation have a lot to answer for. Right, now, more general question. I think it's fair to say that Europe is much more trademark protectionist than the United States. And I'd like to ask whether any members of the audience can think of a place where <coughs> they would grant protection in the United States, but wouldn't here. under registered trademarks. Put aside unfair competition and stuff like that, although there may be the same set of that. First of all, can anybody think of something which is protected in the United States that is not protected in Europe by trademark law? Uh, yes. Go on, then. Resilience. What? Resilience. Resilience. The word resilience. As a, well, it's, not prote it's protected in, in, in the United States and not here. Yeah. For, for, for what? For insurance. what? Insurance. insurance. Well, that's a particular example of a sort of general. I, I, I see that, but I, I can't understand why it can't be registered here, frankly, if it's distinctive in fact. I, I, uh, speaking personally, I don't know whether it's echoed in the, in the audience generally, 
But I find the American uh, grant system and examination system leading to grant much more uh, flexible and relaxed than European than the European system is now. Certainly in the UK, so we can see here. That's right. what I expect. But I, I was thinking of things like comparative advertising, um, protection of well, designs, fancy bottles, they'll give you a fancy bottle. So, I think most would agree that, generally speaking, the United States is less protectionist, particularly in terms of infringement, than Europe. It won't allow you to register a trademark or keep a trademark unless you're using it. Well, Europe doesn't require that. And so on. You couldn't register in the United States for the vast quantity of range of goods you can in Europe and keep it. But isn't that a question of political background? I don't know. IP law? I mean, if you are in this system or you're thinking uh, more free market or more competition, uh, so you uh, go on to register, uh, to let them register. So after the uh, new uh, trademark uh, law in 1995, um, there was a, in Germany, uh, there was a, a, let's say, a wave, uh, as you say, in the United States, and there was a, a, a Theory, let them in, let them in, uh, the trademarks, and then uh, open to the free market. We will see which trademark will survive or not. And we had, of course, in the meanwhile, the other wave. I think it's, it's more the political question. Have and even the judges are of some political background. We're all signatories to the TRIPS agreement. We've all got the same basic standards, but the way in which we've chosen to implement them within the European Union is on a basis which is, I think, philosophically somewhat different from in the United States. I don't mind that in and of itself, but what I, what I just dislike, and it's the recurrent theme in answers from beginning and probably to the end of this discussion, is the way in which those concepts have become runaway concepts in European Union law. Um, the whole concept of unfair advantage is being taken, I think, to somewhat extreme lengths. Uh, I think uh, the question of detriment to distinctive character has become uh, unduly complicated. What we're getting is extremely large rights, and that's where the source of the protectionism comes from. Couple that with um, some pretty big holes. I mean, I find constantly negligible protection in the um, European Union system as written, although not as applied in the United Kingdom recently in particular, for the concept of concurrent use and honest concurrent use. I keep reading all these cases in which somebody's um, registered rights uh, collides with somebody else's application to register. These are very often just paper conflicts, not conflicts at ground level. There was a horrifying case where uh, the Court of Justice upheld the, uh, I think it was still called the Court of First Instance then, it was a case called Carbonell. It involved a situation of conflict between two label marks for olive oil, where the products in question had been on side-by-side -side circulation on a massive scale in Spain continuously for more than 20 years in which it was held that the one mark conflicted with the other. I, f I find that just totally theoretical and unreal. And what I would really wish to see is that we manage the concepts we've got within the Euro European Union much, much better than we do. I don't mind having them different from the United States, that's fine. I just think that the train is a runaway train. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably don't know enough about the, the, the US practices of comment in, in a great deal of, of, of detail. Um, but I, mean, I mean, in terms of extent of right, I mean, what, one of the key things that you know, we've certainly seen in, in our office, and I think this is mirrored throughout Europe and certainly has been the case in Europe for some time, at, at the extent of the specifications that are being filed, I mean, they're, they're, they're now so wide that it's going to have real practical problems when one when goes further down the line in terms of you know assessing what, what Jeffrey has already said are effectively then paper conflicts on the basis of these very very broad rights and that's I think going to create a, a big problem and 
you know, perhaps that needs sort of reining back in to some extent. Do you want to say anything on this? Yes, no, I want to say something about the, the case that, that Jeffrey's mentioned, the Carmino case. Um, because I think it may illustrate a, a particular problem which may need to be focused on. Um, and that relates to the questions of uh, evidence, uh, and in particular there, the evidence of concurrent use and its significance in the context of assessing risk of confusion. Now, so far as the general court's concerned, the CFI before it, um, we are in practice limited by the state of the evidence as it was presented in the administrative procedure before the Board of Appeal. Now, we know that since uh, how old it is, that there's a rehearing before the Board of Appeal, so there's the possibility of new evidence at least at that stage. But by the time the case gets to us, we are effectively looking at the evidence that was presented before the Board of Appeal. Now, I don't know what happened in the, in the case that, that Jeffrey mentioned. But as a general observation, <coughs> we, we very rarely have any significant, whether it's survey evidence or evidence of, on the risk of confusion issue, we're left effectively to say, would we see, seeing these two marks side by side, whether there's a risk of confusion? Now, why is that? That's simply because the office uh, is driven by 100,000 plus new applications each year, uh, the corresponding numbers going down in relation to um, the number of opposition procedures and so on. And the, the, the evidence is, for good or bad reason, not developed at length before the um, uh, boards of appeal, and thus when it gets to us. Um, I, I, I can quite see why, if there was good evidence of, uh, of concurrent use, that, that, that's something that should, uh, if, you, if you like, reverse what would otherwise be a presumption of risk of confusion if you saw two uh, relatively similar marks. But uh, given that you have identical or similar products and identical or similar marks, um, the question then is, how do you reverse that risk of confusion? You really do need fairly substantial evidence to do it. Now, of course, it's different at the stage of uh, infringement. So, I mean, maybe a national court uh, could come to a different view if, if they went on using it. So even if the opposition was, uh, was rejected, it would be open to a national court to say, well, uh, there is, in fact, uh, no risk of confusion here, or how, how, however it's done. But, uh, there were some sections, and I sent, some, I sent Budweiser off to the Court of Justice, and they yes. said it was okay to have honest concurrent use, exactly the same mark, same mark, same goods. Well, it weren't the same goods, the beers were different, but I mean, that didn't really count. Um, well, uh, and, that, that brings to the next question. The, the current litigation system for trademarks, including the opposition system, Does it make any sense? Oliver, you have to sit at the bottom uh, of this pile. Does it, what, the, the, whole, the whole litigation? What, what well, the, yes, including the infringement system, the counterclaims for, for, for revocation, community trademarks um, with perhaps holes in them, uh, 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 the opposition system in Alicante, the appeals to the boards, the appeals onto the general court, the potential appeals onto the, onto the full court. I mean, certainly, certainly that, that, that system sort of, I mean, we, we actually had one of our um, colleagues who has been on, on secondment to the Boards of Appeal come back in the office to give us a, a talk about how it works recently, and uh, you know, he couldn't give any, any real secrets away, but um, you know, he was talking about a lot of the appeals that go up to the General Court, and he was sort of bemoaning being overturned and, 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 and all sorts, and it, there seemed to be some sort of flaw in the way that some of those appeals are actually dealt with, in that um, it, it, from what was being described to us, it seemed to be that if the, if the general court found an error, then it would simply swing the decision right round the other way without actually giving its own view on what the answer should have been. Um, and that, that to me seems fundamentally flawed, because obviously Jeffrey sitting next to me often reviews my decisions. Um, he's probably now and again found an error of law or principle in one of my decisions, and if he does, he'll tell me what the answer should have been. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that perhaps need to be um, to, you know, looked at in terms of how that mechanism and, and procedure works. And I think it sort of opens up a sort of bigger question then about whether or not it's, you know, is it a real, I'm not sure what the alternative is, but is it a, a, 
you know, a, a useful um, use of the general court and ultimately the court of justice's time and money to actually be dealing with these sort of appeals from effectively the OHIM cancellation and opposition divisions. Well, 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 well can, can I sort of answer that and come back and say it's true quite often um, we do send cases back uh, and say that was wrong, go back and do it again. But to a certain extent, uh, well, certainly in my own experience, one of the reasons is, is we feel a little uncomfortable in deciding on the facts having regard to the state of the evidence and so on. And if there's been an error of law, let's send it back and then the parties can put in any further evidence and so on and leave it to the Board of Appeal, possibly to do a better job than, than, than we are. And you are the, the Board of Appeal, I, I think by and large, uh, I'm not trying to say saying that I know of any exception, but I think they do an extremely good job. I, I, I have a great, a great deal of respect for them and, and personally I, I feel very hesitant about changing uh, or reversing an assessment of the Board of Appeal on, on matters like the, uh, the risk of confusion. Um, but certainly one aspect of that is we're very reluctant to, to, to say what we think the Board of Appeal would have decided but for this, this particular mistake. Let them go back and quite frequently, uh, I, I, I realise it makes the whole thing longer, but at least in that particular case it gives the parties the opportunity to provide such further material in the light of what we say the correct approach should have been. Well, do you want to add something about this litigation no. system we no, find no, you? No, more, more, more generally, um, well, more generally, as maybe many of you in the audience know, I mean, we, we in the general court for some time have been very much in favour of creating a specialised court for trademark cases, which ideally in our picture of things would have been populated mainly by uh, national trademark judges who had the experience of the infringement side um, and uh, th that, that could have been a, uh, would be a much better way of dealing with uh, what represents currently between 30 and 40 percent of the case the overall caseload of the general court in terms of case numbers it's slightly less in terms of the workload because by and large the trademark cases are not as complicated as the other things that we deal with um, but uh, that would have, uh, in, our, in our view, produced better results for the parties, um, probably better coherence because at the moment our trademark cases have decided between what is now uh, nine chambers of 27 different judges, thanks to the wisdom of the member states who were unable to agree on increasing the number of judges of our court. The only thing we can think of is doubling the number of judges of our court. That now means there will then be 56 judges. Um, uh, mainly doing other things. Um, I'm not too sure that it's going to produce a lot of co coherence. Be that as it may, that's what the member states and their wisdom have decided we should have. It wasn't what we wanted. Um, well, I was going to say just one, one thing, perhaps you know, quite controversial. Perhaps is um, maybe we need a, a European version of Jeffrey and his appointed person uh, colleagues <laughs> um, have, having a look at things. Yeah. You know, it's, strange, it's strange to us, an appointed person. <laughs> so I think it's a big question. And if you're not prepared enough to decide on this, if we should start again to uh, renew or to think about reform or to alter again something, uh, we are <coughs> filled with problems. So um, uh, I, I think we should stick on what it is now. I think your view, point of view, Marianne, is expressed by Mr. Justice Asprey, an English judge in the 1930s. He said, reform, reform, aren't things bad enough already? <laughs> no, really, there are so many reforms. <laughs> well, it is a completely insane system. It takes years and years. I mean, the, the real world of people registering trademarks and using them and whatnot, this is no this is no businessman's court at all, or system, mm. and we ought to change it. And unfortunately, some of the same, some of the same, but not as many mistakes have been made for the the Unitary Pattern Court. They've made their other mistakes, but not this one. Mm. Okay. Now then, navigate that one. Yeah, you can. I've got some reforms that that will be totally ignored. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is that no one should be allowed to be a juge rapporteur on the General Court or the Court of Justice unless they have spent at least three months in a busy department doing <coughs> trademark clearance work. <laughs> then they will know 
for how difficult it is to clear for descriptiveness and how difficult beyond that it is to clear for relative rights and conflicts with that. That will help them to write clearer, more disciplined judgments in due course. Second thing is there must be an absolute ruling of the CJEU to the effect that nothing that takes place in the context of registration proceedings, uh, uh, registry proceedings in OHIM or the General Court or on appeal to the CJEU gives rise to any issue estoppel or raised judicata. Because if, it, if they don't say that, there's going to be a lot of trouble about collateral effect of what they're doing in that system. The third thing, which they could do, which they won't do, it's been discussed a number of times, is this. Uh, at the moment, the theory is that the General Court is the first judicial instance outside of the administration authority, the competent authority, which is OHIM. And the result of that is that the hearings before the General Court, even though they, in some constitutions they do make an effort um, to cut it back, they have all the appearance of being a complete rehearing, and they suck in huge numbers of appeals on the basis that it's worth going to the General Court in order to have another go at it. It clogs the system. What they ought to do is they ought to recognise that the first judicial instance is the Boards of Appeal, and the Boards of Appeal are in fact very high quality, very knowledgeable. There should then be an approach to the uh, appellate function of the General Court which says we will only interfere on the basis of manifest error or serious procedural irregularity, explaining what it is if they do. And um, we would also get away from the system we have at the moment, which is that the General Court effectively says what it says as the first judicial instance, and you've got virtually no chance on appeal to the Court of Justice because the Court of Justice sits in Casacion. And the effect of that is that the General Court would normally have to have gone stark staringly mad before the Court of Justice will interfere with it, even though the judgment may be less than perfect when viewed from another perspective. <laughs> So there's work to be done. <laughs> well, but uh, doesn't this mean, um, if I understood you correctly, um, the the border between administration and justice is uh, flu fluently now? I mean, we have the strict uh, the uh, power, uh, the three different powers, you know, uh, and I think we should keep on this further on. There is administration and the Board of Appeals from the OIM are still administration and there is court and the general court is the first instance and the first instance, so I as a claimant or, or a party, I really would wish that the court is even, uh, ha will have an eye on the facts as well. Mm -hmm. They may be wonderful persons at the Board of Appeal, but I don't want to trust to them as uh, administration. You know, um, the courts, their, their duty is to control administration. But, but, it's for me a high, high value. Well, I, I, I share Marianne's point, and that is one of the reasons why I think the argument in favor of a specialized IP court is much stronger. And indeed, part of the suggestions were that that would replace the boards of appeal. Um, now, whether one simply moves the boards of appeal to be the specialized court and then only has a limited review at the moment uh, that there is, a, a, as was pointed out, it's a review of fact and law. But if the boards of appeal become properly that first yeah, instance, properly. then their decision on fact will be, will, will be final. And, and that's what it, there's no review. reason why the, court, the general court couldn't have said that from right at the beginning instead of interfering. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we're not having any more of this, we're going over for drinks <laughs> right now. Um, thank you, Marx, for helping organise this. We'll all be back next year, I hope. Uh, and it, it's drinks across the way. Uh, and see you over there or at the top of the stairs.